Peter, to understand consciousness, I went into neuroscience uh, because I thought that was the way to understand it. And it seems like if the claim is that everything mental is caused by the brain, it seems like you have to claim the so-called brain-mind identity theory. You have to assume that the brain and mind are the same thing, but they certainly don't feel like the same thing. How can you make that claim? How can you claim that spikes of activity, uh, electrical activity in neurons, is the smell of garlic? Yeah, so, so this is, you know, the problem first posed, I suppose, by Leibniz. How can two things be identical and yet have incompatible properties? Well, they, he would argue they can't, right? So if something, uh, well, if something is um, publicly observable, like I can, you're like your brain, I can open up your skull and look at your neurons, uh, it can't simultaneously be not publicly observable, which is your thoughts, which are presumably realized in those mental, I mean, in those physical actions. And I think there, there is a, a way around this, which is to say that uh, energy has not only an amount, but also a pattern or organization. And the question then is, is uh, physical causation only reduced to amounts of energy? Now, if you, if you think about the world as it was conceived by Newton, it was primarily about amounts, conservation of amount of energy or mass, con uh, conservation of momentum. There is very little in there about any causal role for organization of matter. Now, let's take a lump of clay. That I can take that lump of clay. I can't create more clay than is there. I, I can't create energy from nothing. Uh, I can't destroy that energy. But what I can do is I can change its organization. I can make a little house. I can, then I can destroy that form and make a little man. And I can do, destroy that form. So form or organization or pattern is not conserved. It doesn't obey the rules that are obeyed by mm. amounts of energy. There's no law of the conservation of patterns mm. or law of the conservation of organization. But the key question then is, can organization of energy, of energetic inputs, have an effect? And I think that for the vast majority of nature, the answer is no. In fact, you know, uh, water falling down a cliff doesn't say, oh, if this pattern of water occurs, then I will do that. Mm -hmm. But evolution came up with a, an amazing solution, which is, uh, in the case of neurons, uh, pattern detection. And the key pattern that neurons detect is simultaneous inputs. Neurons are what we call leaky integrators. They, they, they have a time constant on the order of, say, 30 milliseconds. And if inputs, two action potentials or more, arrive at the same time, that might depolarize or excite the neuron to the extent that it will fire. But if two spikes or action potentials arrive outside of that window, it's as if they're completely ind independent. You're constantly resetting the system. But because of this physical mechanism of detecting patterns, namely simultaneous tenacity detection or coincidence detection, it's a, it's a game changer because now patterns in energy for the first time in the history of the universe can be causal of uh, mm. subsequent events in the universe. Mm. You make the, uh, the model of mental causation to three parts, three stages. Uh, how does that work? So the thought is, you know, a neuron um, can reset the synapses on another neuron. So that would be the first stage. You can change the, what will count as inputs to, that, uh, to a neuron that will drive it. And then inputs will come and they will, so the second stage would be inputs would come and they would e uh, either meet those criteria or not. And if those criteria are met, you have the third stage, which is, which is that neuron then firing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm calling it criterial causation, but it's simply what neurons are doing. Mm -hmm. They're, they, the neurons are not assessing the amounts of inputs, they're assessing patterns in the input, especially the pattern of simultaneity or coincidence. Uh, the system is set up as a coincidence detection system from top to bottom. And if inputs arrive simultaneously to a sufficient degree, the neuron will fire. And uh, I think a key step in this criterial causation that neurons realize is that neurons um, can reset other neurons criteria for firing. So it's almost, uh, one analogy would be, you know, speaking and the shaping of your mouth. So if I were only to measure the vibrations of your vocal cords, I'd have no idea what you're saying. I would just get, uh, right, coming off your vocal cords. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening is that the, the energy coming off your vocal cords is then filtered through this, the filter of your mouth, and it is that very rapidly changing 
um, waiting on, or shaping that leads to you being able to speak. Now, on that analogy, action potentials are like the energy that gets funneled mm -hmm. through the system, mm -hmm. but the synapses, the synaptic weights that are rapidly changing, allow the action potentials to take on a, a voice so that the neurons can speak to each other. Okay. So, so if this is true, and if you have this um, new way of thinking about the identity of brain and mind, uh, uh, is that what's called a functionalism, where, you're, where the pattern itself becomes the, the dominant factor, and then you could realize that in different media? So right. you could realize that in silicon or maybe even in uh, uh, mechanical circuits if you had a, enough of them in, in, in a way. So right. the, I, the, the consequence of what you're saying seems to be that everything that we have that's mental or consciousness or inner experience can be realized in non-biological uh, matters. Uh, I I think that, in fact, uh, no mind or mental causation or consciousness has been realized in anything non-biological yet. I don't deny that it could happen. But where my view differs from a functionalist point of view is that I actually think that the, the way that the components work in our, in our brain and our brain temperatures are very key to the way the system works. So if we, you know, I think the, the key claim of functionalism is it's like software and you can take as long as the patterns of input and output the functional relationships are maintained, you can transfer it to a different system. But if it turns out, for example, that um, the degree to which um, random events in the synapse, like the Brownian motion of neurotransmitters mm -hmm. going across the 40 nanometer synaptic cleft is key to the spike timing, uh, you know, the, the amplification of uh, that, that degree of randomness to randomness at spike timing, then you can't simply remove that and put it onto some other system, right? Our kind of... You have to build that in. You would have system. to build that in. And um, so it's, it's what I'm arguing is not a, really a simple kind of functionalism because I'm not arguing that you could easily transfer it to a, a different... Uh, well, easily is not the issue. Domain. Nobody thinks any of this stuff is easy. Uh, the question is, is it in principle possible? And you say it is. Perhaps in principle. Well, you it, say perhaps. That's a, you don't, don't give me a perhaps. I mean, give me, you know, it, 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 is in, it is in principle possible or it's not. Okay. Well, I mean, let's, let's take a single channel. I think a, a very important ch channel or receptor in, in pyramidal cells and other kinds of cells is called an NMDA receptor. It has very specific properties that are dependent on very specific uh, chemical interactions. And... Blocking that, blocking that NMDA receptor is a single magnesium ion. And so the behavior of that channel is going to depend on the behavior of that single mm. atom. Now, that, it turns out, uh, the behavior of that channel can be amplified perhaps up to the level of uh, spike timing changes, right? So you're, you're amplifying an atomic level event and uncertainty at that level up to the level potentially of uncertainty and spike timing. So whether that kind of physical mechanism could be easily realized in some other physical mechanism, I just don't know. But I do know that what evolution, evolution came up with in this amazing coincidence detector of the NMDA receptor uh, is very specific in its physical properties. Okay, so what is the implication of that for the traditional claim of, a, of, of an identity between brain and mind? Okay, so all we have in our heads is cells. We're all cells, right? Um, but uh, the, the key insight, I think, is that um, cells are not just... Uh, their amounts of energy, their their organization of energy, and in fact, you know, I mean, it's obvious that you might be completely physically different than you were yesterday. I could probably replace every atom with a you know a different atom. So what's key about you is your organization. And so, um, yes, uh, mental events are entirely realized in physical events, namely neuronal events. Um, but uh, what what's key about them is that they're uh, realized in the organization, especially this the, the the spatiotemporal organization um, and simultaneity being a really key pattern that the brain uses to uh, encode all other kinds of patterns, right? So, for example, I can have a spatial pattern of your face and I can actually learn your face and I can perhaps even wire up 
a neuron or multiple neurons mm -hmm. that will be tuned to your face, and yeah. I'll recognize you 30 years from now, mm -hmm. even though you might look quite different. Now, how do I do that? Well, um, I have taking, taken uh, a certain pattern of inputs that uh, only seems to arise in the presence of your face, and now um, I have a neuron or neurons that are responding to that pattern of input. And that, uh, so how does mind come into this? Well, if there is information in the world or information that is uh, such that anytime that information is the case, like you're there, this neuron fires or population of neurons fires. And when you're not there, it doesn't fire. So if and only if the information is the case, these neurons fire, then this body has the capacity to use that information. If, um, so yes, uh, information is realized physically. It's realized physically in spatiotemporal organizations of neuronal activity. But that doesn't mean that it's identical to the amount of the energy. Right? So I think that it's possible to be um, a physicalist, and I'm a physicalist. It's possible to be an identity theorist, and I would say that, that I'm that too, but it, it's focusing on two different aspects of energy. There's the physical component of energy, which is, you know, the amounts, but then there's the question of the organization of the energy. Until now, I think it's been hard for people to uh, really grasp that the organization of the energy itself can be causal. And so the uh, criteria of causation that I'm discussing is uh, a mechanism whereby patterns in energy, particularly in neuronal inputs, can be causal not only of brain events, but changes in the universe because my brain events can then cause me to do something physical in the world.